Um, I finished my presentation so shortly ago that there actually wasn't time for it to reach the organization over the interwebs. I had to put it on a stick. So this is really the product of at least 20 people, I think. It's the product of everybody here because I've been listening as hard as I could, as I promised to do. But it's really also the product of a bunch of amazing people who have been in all the sessions trying to make sense of things that they didn't always fully understand and have reported back impartially and intelligently to me throughout the conference. So I really want to thank them up front. So why mice? Well, it really relates to the cats. Um, because when I was invited to do this closing speech and having watched Molly go through this last year, I really felt like it must be a process of herding cats, um, trying to chase down what this incredibly diverse crowd of people is up to in these three days, what people are trying to figure out, what they're working on, how they think they relate to each other. And I found that this was really the best metaphor you know, um, cats are thoughtful, smart creatures that take their own path. And this conference has really been hurting them. Having said that, there's also this sense as my data moves into becoming a formal organization with governance and an opinion about where it belongs, that this is sort of a Tower of Babel moment for everybody here, for everyone involved in thinking this model through and creating it, co-creating it together. Because, you know, as you probably all know, the Tower of Babel was a moment where people built this incredible thing to try to talk to God, and God flicked it and it fell down, and they all disappeared into different corners of the world, and that was how people started speaking different languages. So, one of the things that comes out of this, these three days for me is how to make sense of all the different languages that people are speaking here and how to understand sort of the common tongue, how to understand beyond this My Data Declaration. In practice, what do people think unites them? What do people think are the most important points they're trying to make? And what is going to carry through in this process of fragmentation in order to create something bigger? Which leads me to the question of which my data should I talk to you about right now? There are lots of different my data's available, thoughtful cats out there. Should I talk to you about the my data of actions, of specific innovations that are highly targeted and really well thought through, of atoms that people are working on and building in really intricate ways and connecting together? little components of the greater whole that work like little cogs for which you have to have a sense of the whole machine? Or should I talk to you about the my data that is bigger than that? Here is a picture which some of you may recognize. It's an impressionist painting. And I think of this when I think of this sort of atomic vision of my data, of all of the little things that everyone's working on, because it makes sense when you look at the whole shebang, but then when you zoom in on it, like, like I've had to in the last few days, it gets a little more confusing. There's a lot of green making up the pink, and there's a lot of pink making up the white, and you sort of start to lose track of how those atoms are interacting to form a coherent whole. So could it be a wave instead? We know it's a network. Is it a field of belief and understanding and motion where people are taking a single unifying ideal and using it in lots of different ways that do fundamentally relate to each other? These are some of the things that have come up in terms of where our data is actually going and being used right now. Government, the commons, security, research, the commercial world, there are a lot more things there than I have noted. But this does make me think my data is more of a system and we need a complex systems approach to understand it, to understand how it's going to develop next. It's a set of entanglements and a set of relationships, and many of the most important kinds of data are actually residing outside it right now. It is reaching to understand how to deal with the really important data. And I'll come back to this in a minute. It also connects networks of innovation 
around a set of interactions. This is one of those interactions. The building of mydata.org is going to be the next set of interactions. The, the acquisition of governance and archiving and a new sense of self for my data is going to give it a whole new flavor in terms of how networked it is and how entangled it is. One example of this, one of the little mice that those cats are chasing, is portability. Portability is one of the main technical tracks that's been going on since day one of my data, obviously, because it relates to the central principle that our data is our data. Is it a point, an atom? Is it an apparatus you can create for the transfer of data from one provider to another? The exercise of a right. Or is it a process? Is it, and I'm quoting from Daniel here, I stole this, a continuous ability to access and reuse one's own data? Obviously, it can also be both of those things. But different tracks address it in totally different ways. Here's another example, another little mouse. Identity. This is also absolutely central to what we're talking about here this week. Is it a set of data points that can be stored, ordered, and accessed under controlled conditions? This is sort of the technical vision of identity that I'm hearing come out at this conference. Or is it a relational process of mutual shaping by individuals, by communities, by states, by institutions and organizations, of what people are? Obviously, it's both of these things. It behaves differently in different places, like a particle and a wave. So, what's the target? How, do, how does the cat connect to the mouse? Do we want to stage a revolution? Some people talk about revolution in this gathering. Are we resisting something? Or are we trying to reform things? Well, if we're thinking about revolution, it has some characteristics that my data movement really shares. Uh, a revolution turns from a powerful, a single powerful idea into a movement. You could say that we're doing that here. It is inherently oppositional, and there are oppositional aspects of my data. It is disruptive, and I hear the word disruption a lot at this gathering too. So is it a revolution? Well, this is the kind of revolution that happens in tech. It's shiny, it's beautiful, it's disruptive, it's new. This is the kind of revolution that happens in society. It's not quite so nice. Things get broken, people get broken. If we actually staged a revolution, nobody would be happy at the end of it. Is it resistance, then? This is a quote about where data should live. Big tech's data should be put in a public trust. They can use it, people can opt in and opt out. That trust is run by an independent board. It just can't be that big tech are the sole proprietors of this data. I think this is a public good. Hands up if you agree with this. Sounds reasonable, right? Hands up if you recognize who's saying this. One, two, three. Okay, well then I'll put up the picture. This is who's saying it. Steve Bannon said this two days ago, and he's echoing Donald Trump and saying that that the internet companies that Donald Trump doesn't like are a, are a trust and that they should be broken up. So, if it's not that kind of resistance that we're interested in, if we don't want to align with the Trump administration, are we interested in reform, maybe? What does reform do for us? Well, reform is achieved by organizations, by coalitions, and by networks. That could work. It requires a lot of engagement with institutions and with law and with politics. And this is something I've really heard coming up and that I'm going to try and talk about in a minute. This is the year when I'm hearing my data think a lot about what is missing in terms of understanding the institutional context in which it might work. And I think this is happening because my data is becoming global. It's engaging with different cultures and different systems. And it's getting to a point where these questions are really pressing in. It also needs a broad network with consensus about central issues, which pretty much describes what I think my data is becoming right now. So I kind of have hope for reform, even though it's the least sexy of these three options. 
Reform is also a process that's a bit like a wave. It takes a really long time, it happens in stages, and just when everyone is really bored, you discover that you achieved it. <laughs> so what is the kind of my data that can create reform? Who can herd these cats in a way that they actually want to go? Well, there's a few mice involved in this. The questions that I'm hearing this year include, who's going to implement this thing? Where will it happen? How will it get realized? In light of that, what do we actually agree on? What are the mice we want to chase, rather than the mice that we're going to let get away from us? What do we disagree on? Which mice do we want to see get away? What are we missing? And what can we not understand yet? What are the unknown, the known unknowns, not the unknown unknowns? So to move on to the content of who's going to do it, well, this is what I see right now, and this is what pretty much what Yogi put up at the start of this conference. Tech, legal, social, business. It sounds really simple, and yet we haven't achieved it right now. We found we had, what, three lawyers here at the opening plenary? We need more. We need more people who understand the mechanics of how things get put into practice in politics and in society. It's not just tech that can do that. It's also the law. Um, one nice thing from this year is that the Our Data crew are no longer the dissidents. We now feel like we're at the center of a fairly coherent conversation about us and the broader us and the smaller us, and about my and we. What is the position of the GAFAs with regard to my data? This is a very complicated issue, and I don't think anyone knows the answer right now, including them, but I think it's very clear that my data exists in relation to a larger economy of data, and it has to position itself intelligently and politically with regard to that. What about government? Where does government belong in this? Can my data happen without the consent and active cooperation of government? And if so, what does that look like? What about data brokers? This kind of goes along with the GAFAS question. Data brokers are so big we can't even see them, but they're the ones who are actually using and creating value out of data right now. If we shut them out of our understanding of how data should flow, not does flow, but should flow, what are we missing? Where is my data going to be? MyData.org is looking at the world. It's not just looking at the Nordic countries. So we're seeing a huge shift here. Somebody said yesterday in a session, what is my digital home? And I really like that. My data is based on an idea of where I belong and where I want to have influence in the world, where I can do good, where I can create change, where I can get traction on events and on my own data. What does it mean that data is now global, that data is collected and flows across boundaries all the time, across jurisdictions, across sets of practices, and across different commercial actors? How are we going to deal with that in a my data world? Following on from that, can it be implemented in radically different configurations of policy, of politics, of markets? What would it mean to do my data in China? What would it mean to do my data in Singapore or in sub-Saharan African countries? How much equality does my data really require? This is also a where question, because the Nordic countries are very special, and those who live here know that. But for those of us who are not from Nordic countries, it really sticks out that my data, the model relies on a lot of literacy, literacy in terms of rights, literacy in terms of data literacy and tech literacy, but also literacy in terms of understanding where your data is, who you want to interact with about your data, and what you might want to do with it. That doesn't exist everywhere. My last question about where is, is my data going to be primarily urban? This keeps popping up and then it disappears again. Are people in cities better equipped? Is the infrastructure, are they better resourced? Are cities more prepared to help? And are cities the ones with leverage to help create my data? Cities can educate, they can procure technology, they can prioritize one type of provision over another, they can create infrastructure. My data might want to start thinking about whether it belongs only in cities or whether it has a plan for being elsewhere as well, and how it can get leverage to grow if it's going to be everywhere as opposed to just cities. But cities may be the best allies right now. 
<clears throat> How will it actually be done? Or, as I say, where did the clouds go? Last year, there were a ton of cloud conversations going on. It was very central, I remember the thought of, so I have to think about my data in relation to personal clouds, in relation to independent cloud providers. I need to think about clouds as being civil society objects rather than business objects. This year, there's not so much cloud conversation. This year, there's sort of conversation about servers, I've heard. I've heard conversation about different types of cloud provision, but really the cloud thing has been subsumed, and I was interested in this because here is a nice, friendly domestic server in your house. This is where my data could live in one version. Then there's a big server in your garage. This is where a different version of my, my data could live. If you really wanted to start getting into the kind of data that's used to profile you all over the world, you'd need greater capacity. Then there's sort of the private cloud solution which could be situated pretty much anywhere, but has the possibility for data localization, for really channeling data within a community or within a country. And then finally, there's the actual cloud, which arguably these other services rely on to different extents and in different ways. Is it possible to do my data without being part of this cloud? It's hard to say right now, but I would welcome my data getting a position on what the cloud is because it is a huge political and economic and structural object belonging across lots of different actors, none of whom, almost none of whom, live here. And so what it means to engage with the GAFAs, what it means to engage with AI, which I'll come to also, and the cloud seem to be really important questions coming out of this year's conference. So, as importantly, what do we agree on right now? And really, we agree on a lot. It was, it was nicely hard to find points of dangerous friction this year. I think one important thing is people here agree that agency, individual agency, is really central to understanding what they want to build and how they want to build it. There were a lot of encouragingly deep conversations about agency and what it means, and a lot of implications from tech as well about what agency means to tech. It's nice that the we versus the I is less of a tension now, it's becoming less important. I think because AI is more prominent than it was last year in the international conversation and consciousness, and so we're understanding that our data takes on value in the company of other people's data. And this was something that, that I hit hard on last year, but I think everyone already knew this, that fundamentally data collection is flowing into AI. It's flowing into AI in the cloud on a huge, huge scale. And in order to manipulate data on the local community level, we need to have an understanding of what it's doing elsewhere. <coughs> Identity and identification are central to getting other important tech built. This is kind of a no-brainer, but identity and identification have been a really strong conversation this year, and I've seen them start to bleed into other tracks, outside the tech and business track, and I find that really encouraging. Also, I've noticed that use cases around the environment and health are really leading the way in terms of all of these other things. All the things we're thinking about, these issues keep popping up. We can deal with health data, we can conceptualize what we want from it, we can think about the drawbacks of using particular tech on health data, we can think about the advantages of using particular tech and what kind of tech might bring those advantages. The same with the environment. I've heard a lot about environmental sensing, about pollution. These things both connect to rights very clearly, they both connect to the individual, and they connect to safety and things that we really care about strongly and that we all think about all the time. <clears throat> other issues are much harder, other political issues particularly. How, you know, use cases for, I don't know, data for administrative data, uh, use cases for commercial data are not as clear to me as a listener as the ones about my right to be safe, my right to breathe clean air and my right to be healthy or to healthcare. What kind of frictions came up this year? Well, there is an important one about AI. 
it pops up, it goes away. We know it's important. We know that data fundamentally flows into AI models now. But where does AI really belong in a my data world? I didn't hear that clearly enough articulated. I think that's the, one of the next places that this, this group needs to go. Um, Privacy, it was interesting. Privacy's meaning seems to be really shifting. I think this is probably due to all of the massive violations of privacy, of legal privacy, that have been in the news this year and last year. People are reconceptualizing what is important about privacy. I'm still hearing a conversation from some business and tech people about how people are not interested in privacy. There is a privacy paradox where people say one thing and behave differently. But I'm also hearing interesting ideas about how privacy relates to control how privacy relates to security, how the two can be the same thing, um, and how also group visibility is as important as individual visibility. This seems to be something that people sort of didn't need to take on board, they already felt it. There's definitely a friction around what constitutes personal data, which I celebrate because the GDPR debatably makes everything personal data. It's really difficult. Somebody brought up an excellent example of taking a photograph yesterday. They said, so one example from a session was, if I take a photograph of somebody else, is that their data or is it mine because it has metadata attached to it that can identify me, that place me in a particular place taking a photo at a particular time? Um, health data also works this way. Data which is observed and captured about me in a very remote way, including by my smart energy meter, including by the services and objects that I use, including by the IoT objects in my house, all sorts of things, can tell you a story about my health, which is very sensitive and very personal. The definition of personal data becomes so broad as to be really problematic. So this is a friction that I was definitely seeing happen. What do we want to capture and turn into our data? And what are we prepared to let just exist out there? These things may have equally important implications for us, as it turns out. Decentralization. This is always a friction. What do we want to decentralize? And what happens if we manage to do that? There are increasingly great tools for decentralizing data, responsibility, trust, all sorts of things. But I have some real questions about what it means if we succeed. What does it mean to divorce ourselves from the larger community? We can live in the my data community successfully without living in a state, without living in a collective, without having to encounter people we disagree with about data. So what does it mean to decentralize data? It doesn't make us safe from dissent and friction and disagreement. Finally, I love this quote, my data cannot make everyone happy at the same time. <laughs> it's something that I'm not sure I was hearing last year. I think everybody was super happy just to be here discussing this important thing. And this year, there's much more of a sense of what are the trade-offs? Who is winning and who is losing? How can I see the others that are currently invisible to me? So I appreciated someone saying that. So here's an example of a friction point that I saw this year is consent. Because in certain tracks, consent is taken for granted. Consent is a basic building block for how you move data around and how you use data. And this is true. This is how consent operates right now in the market, in the political world. The data market needs consent to function. It's not the only way to acquire and use data, but it's a really important and arguably greatly overused one because it works. It works because the story is that it creates agency and it empowers the user. And we're all about empowerment here. It acknowledges that we're rational beings who can choose what happens to our data. It creates an understanding of what will happen next. And it's legally robust. All these things are true. At the same time, they are deeply problematic. Because just because we consent to something doesn't mean we actually understand what is going to happen next. As we have observed in the news, just because you consent to something doesn't mean you fully understand what the other person is thinking at the time. And I would say this is very true of the data market. We consent to having our data fly around the planet working for others. But we don't really understand what its trajectory is or what it means for us over the long term. I would say, in fact, it's impossible to understand that right now. The complexity of the data market is such 
The trajectory of the bits and bytes that we emit every second of our lives through everything we touch and interact with and mail and think about, those tracks, those networks, those waves are too complicated. We're all in the position of meeting Harvey Weinstein in a hotel lobby and saying, yeah, that sounds okay, I'll come upstairs. So having said that, what are the tensions that have emerged? Well, one thing I've heard is trust as a feature versus trust as a bug. Generally, trust is something that is considered to be something you can create, you can generate, you can manipulate, and you can use. It's something that is a contract between people, it's understood, and it's something positive. For social scientists, trust is a bit of a bug. Trust is something that makes people consent when they shouldn't. Trust is something that stops people questioning when they should question. Trust is something that gets in the way of democratic deliberation. And so I think we need to weigh these two visions of trust, which are not mutually exclusive. We need people to trust, but also trust requires vulnerability by its nature. And we need to think about what that vulnerability means in the broader market. My data and AI, this feels like a tension as well as something people are starting to deal with. Somebody said, my data is dead, welcome ethical AI middleman. <laughs> and I'm just going to put that there and let you think about it. Pro-human uses of data in the my data model also create a huge problem for environmental sustainability. Hands up who's heard the word blockchain this week. Okay, hands up who knows how much energy blockchain uses right now. Not all blockchains are the same, this is totally true. But using the word blockchain to mean something that solves social problems is in itself problematic. We need to interrogate people who are saying we need to use the blockchain for this and ask them which blockchain? What kind of blockchain? What do we mean? What do we want it to do? Are there any other alternatives that might use less energy, for instance? Other things. Unity and diversity. This is more sociological, but my data has started off in a very flat place. It is the Nordic model. Nordic countries are very equal. They have a good social economy of care and welfare. They have a lot of trust between citizens, governments, and corporations. And this is very unusual in the world. What does it mean to move this model from a flat place to the bumpy, super diverse reality? that includes passive data subjects, who exist even here, of course, but out in the world, there are, huge di there are huge differences in the extent to which people understand what is going on with their data, or can understand, have access to information about what is going on with their data. There are huge differences in connectivity and in infrastructure, in resources, and thus in the extent to which people can engage with their data. What does it mean to become global in this context? It's hard to say. Having said that, what do we need to learn? One thing we really need to learn about is governance and law. There have been some great conversations about trust and trusts as legal configurations that might help with my data, about cooperatives, about lots of other new data governance models which might well be relevant to the way that both technical people and business people think about how to contribute in a my data world. How can we know what we want from these models and what kind of discussion with whom needs to take place? This is a big question for me. Also in the Our Data theme, we've seen a lot of people talking about if data isn't property, if it's not just an asset, although it can behave like an asset, then what else is it? Is it labor? Is it the general intellect? And I'm stealing from Christopher Olk here. I recommend you to go look at his presentation. It was fascinating. Um, is it a raw material or is it a right? Is it a duty? In which case, whose duty to whom? Is it our duty to the state? Is it our duty to the corporations whose products we use? Is it our duty to each other? Is it a commons which could incorporate all of these? It might help to have an idea of what we think data is or isn't as we move forward. Also, how to make sure that data feeds into the kind of systems that tell the truth about us and that build a world that we want. We've seen over the last year that data can really tell any story. One of the most interesting things about the Cambridge Analytica debacle for me 
was all of the social psychologists and behavioral sort of cognitive specialists who said, there is no proof that this altered anyone's behavior in any way. What it did was put a spanner in the works of democracy more broadly. We don't know if it changed one person's vote, but it matters that we don't know. And so how we make sure we don't channel data in ways that are going to mess with the things we value is a really important question. Similarly, does my data have a position on guarding against exploitation? We talk about this a lot, but we don't talk about whose exploitation, how that exploitation might be textured, and how it might work. There was an interesting discussion in a couple of sessions, actually, on the idea of data prostitution, the idea that some people's data will be more valuable than other people's data, that those people can sell their data for a higher price, and what that means both for the concept of moving your data around and for equality in general. Finally, a really important one, history, tools, precedents, markets, resource allocation, resource definitions, and I'm stealing this wholesale from Sean McDonald, who has written a lot on this. Please go look at what he's written. You may not be interested in politics and structure, but politics and structure are definitely interested in you, to misquote Leon Trotsky. Any movement that doesn't have a sense of where it belongs in history, what it's adopting that has failed before, what it's adopting that it needs to change, and where it situates itself politically and structurally is doomed to failure. My data needs some lawyers, some legal philosophers, a ton of governance experts, and then everyone here will have more fun, I guarantee you. <laughs> Somebody very wise said to me today, you need first of all a systems lawyer who understands what's going on out there, but they just shut you down. Their job is to talk about compliance and to reduce risk. They're risk averse. You also need your lawyer who can explain to you what you can do and what is the best way to do it and who will help you imagine a future. So I really recommend that my data goes out and seeks out its own lawyers who can talk about the way that it connects to systems and to governments and to pol politicians and to the rest of the world in a helpful and interesting way that stimulates better discussion. Having said that, next steps. Clearly, the next step is to learn from other places, and those places are already represented here, which is very exciting. How is my data going to become global? What will we be talking about this time next year? Connected to that, who are the allies? Who can teach lessons about history, and especially about what not to do? And what traction can my data have on all the other data that is not my data? <laughs> on inference? on the selling of derivatives from us and from our data. This is going to become a very important question. It already is. Finally, how can we shape these convenings so that the social track, for want of a better term, and the tech and business experts learn from each other? Somebody made a good suggestion in the note takers meeting that maybe we should have the morning being tech and business and the afternoon being everybody else, so that people have no choice but to go to other tracks than they would normally go to. That was one suggestion that I found really interesting. So just to finish up, there are some edge cases that I think are important to consider here, and these are they. There are probably a lot more, and probably everyone here could contribute a really interesting edge case. But I would encourage my data to move beyond thinking about technological edge cases, to connect those to social edge cases. Who are the edge people that we need to include? What does it mean that we live in super diverse societies? What does it mean that all of our data is now feeding AI and is traveling very far away from us? All of these edge cases are going to be important next. And finally, I want to say thank you to everybody here for including me, because I'm really an outsider, and I really appreciate this opportunity to do research on this fascinating and diverse group of people who share this point of view on something really interesting. And somebody sent me earlier a different XKCD comic, and I really feel like this is my experience of my data in the last two years. I was invited into the room with all the colored balls in it, and I got to just jump in and play. And it's been really nice, so thank you very much.